Okay. Um, I had some questions in relation to board appointments uh, for Australia Post, and um, um, but they are technically, I think, corporate questions, so I'll ask them now. Mr Bruce MacGyver, he's the former Liberal Party uh, director in Queensland. Did he go through a merit-based selection process before being, being appointed to the board? Was he recommended by the department or appointed by the government? Uh, Senator, let me just see if I've got um, some detail on that here. The general point I guess I would make is that um, positions, appointments to boards, um, the recommendation for where the people come from can come from a range of um, a range of. Yes, I know sources. that. Did it so, come from the department in this instance? No, no, I understand. I'm just going to see whether I've got that for you here or alternatively whether we... Um, it may be something we can come back to in outcome five when I've got more. Well, perhaps here. you can chase it up while Australia Post are giving evidence. Um, on Friday, the fifth of March, the minister announced reappointment of Tony Nutt um, to the board. Can you confirm this appointment was approved by the cabinet on the first of March, but announced on the Friday? Uh, Senator, I'd have to take that on notice. Okay, so um, you can't answer whether there was a merit-based selection process as part of reappointment. Um, how many other candidates were considered for that board position? Senator, the, for the, the there was um, a decision around a reappointment um, in a sense. If a decision is taken to reappoint an existing board member, obviously there's no need to go through any other process to identify other candidates. Okay, so uh, can you just give me quickly the date of his reappointment and the date of the approval? Um, like, Senator, I'll, I'll, we'll, we will find If you find can just take it on notice yes. the date of um, his reappointment well, the, and the date of the expiry of his term, please. Uh, what skills and attributes does he bring to the Australia Post Board? apart from being a Liberal Party hack and a mate of Scott Morrison's? I think that, Senator, I think we mentioned last time there are a range of skills that are, um, or the description of the sorts of skills that Mr Nutt has and all the board members has are disclosed by Australia Post in their annual report. It's on page 59 of their annual report, their bios that explain that. Surely. As an appointment of the government, you can give a more robust defence of why he's a suitable candidate here. Why does the government keep putting Liberals on the board of Australia Post? Senator, I'm happy to read what is in the Australia Post report, if you like. Tony Nutt was appointed to the Australia Post board in March 2018. His current term expires in March 2024. He brings a depth of knowledge and wide range of skills, including public policy and budget expertise, strategy development and implementation, and stakeholder relations. Mr Nutt has more than 35 years' experience advising both federal and state governments, including more than 10 years' service as the principal advisor to former Prime Minister, the Honourable John Howard, and Chief of Staff to the former Attorney General, the Honourable Darrell Williams. He was also federal and state director of the Liberal Party of Australia, director general in Cabinet, and principal advisor to the former Premier of Victoria, the Honourable Ted Bailey. He's currently an adjunct professor in the School of Arts and Science at the University of Notre Dame, and a member of the Council of the Australian, of the National Museum of Australia. Thank you, Senator Hume. That might sound all right on paper. However, it's openly known that Tony Nutt is disruptive on the board. He regularly intervenes with uninformed opinions and unnecessarily politicises even innocuous decisions the board tries to make. I would suggest that that is Why speculation, is Senator Pratt, and that you have no evidence of that. We'll see. Thank you, Chair. So can I just confirm, Senator Pratt, that uh, the opposition is happy for us now to move to Australia Post? Thank you. Terrific. Thank you, Secretary. Um, I will now call officers from Australia Post uh, if they could come to the table with us. We will call just a short suspension for a minute or two while people come up from the uh, witness room downstairs.
Right, the committee uh, will resume, and um, with officers from Australia Post, I welcome back Mr. Di Bartolomeo and uh, Mr. Boys. Would either of you like to make an opening statement? I would, uh, Chair. Thank you very much. Mr. Boys, please continue. Thank you, Chair, Senators. Rodney Boys, Acting Group Chief Executive Officer, Managing Director, Australia Post. As we sit here today, our thoughts are with those in New South Wales and Queensland that not long ago were facing bushfires and now dealing with devastating floods. It's also difficult to contemplate that it has now been a year since Australia and the world entered into this period of considerable uncertainty, with the WHO declaring a pandemic, state borders, shops, offices and schools being closed, Qantas standing down two thirds of their staff and almost all of their planes. The challenges that followed through 2020 were significant. Unpredictable COVID-19 outbreaks, ever-changing government restrictions affecting our operations and significantly reduced flights that would have carried tonnes of mail coupled with structural changes accelerating the parcel growth and reducing letter volumes. Despite all of that, Australia Post has achieved very strong outcomes, keeping our people safe, delivering on our social responsibility and our dual legislated community service and commercial obligations. To keep delivering for all Australians, we opened 60 new or repurposed facilities, added 3,000 vehicles, put on additional dedicated planes and recruited an extra 5,000 people. Our post office network again paid an essential role supporting local communities during COVID outbreaks and restrictions. These results are a testament of the hard work, focus and commitment of our incredible team and our licensed post office and delivery contract partners working tirelessly under difficult circumstances to deliver for the community. We acknowledge that 2020 had its challenges, that the changes implemented to deal with the crisis were done quickly and the consultation and timeframes that would normally be expected were condensed given the uncertain future at the time. We do not underestimate the impact these changes, coupled with the growth in parcel volumes, had on our people. However, I'm pleased to say that during my recent facility visits, I have witnessed considerable collaboration and positive progress being made. November and December were the biggest months in our history. More than 86 million domestic parcels delivered an increase of almost 30% and at the same time we improved our service levels. We would not have been able to deliver these volumes without the changes made. We would not have met the needs of the community that created a surge in parcel volumes without the temporary regulatory relief that was provided or without the support of our dedicated posties, including the more than 2,000 who underwent training and transitioned to deliver parcels from vans. Further, with the reduction of motorcycles across our network, we have witnessed a 40% reduction in serious motorcycle injuries since July 2020. Senators, last month we released our half-year results for FY 2021. Parcels and service revenue in the first half rose 25.9% to 3.4 billion. At the same time, our letters revenue fell to 0.9 billion, with volumes down 13.6%. It is pleasing that after a credit downgrade in November 2019, our first half profit before tax this year grew to 166.6 million although this is still well below the profit levels before the credit downgrade. Cash generated enabled investment to increase by 40.3 million to 189.4 million for the first half, with continued investment to increase the capacity in our parcels network, including the new Sunshine West parcel facility, which opened pre-Christmas and now employs over 750 Australia Post people. While in Australia the, the immediate crisis feels like it is behind us, the spectre of COVID-19 remains, and with it too the structural changes accelerated by COVID. Online shopping has become a way of life, with over 70% of Australian households regularly shopping online, 
including an additional 2.1 million households that shopped online in December 2020 that did not shop the previous December. In contrast, after years of letter volumes steadily declining at around 10 per cent, volumes for the 11 full months post-COVID have fallen 17.4 per cent. That is 314 million fewer letters than for the same 11 months pre-COVID. Excuse me, Mr. Boys, just how much longer do you have? Two paragraphs, uh, three paragraphs. Thank you, okay. thank you, Senator. Thank, thank you, Chair. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> I haven't read it. Thank you. Thank you. We we know that to continue delivering on our community and commercial obligations, more changes may be required, and we recognise the need for proper consultation, and we are committed to exactly that going forward. Senators, we have emerged from 2020 with an enhanced awareness of what Australians expect of us, having recently made changes to ensure the more effective, efficient, economical and ethical use of public resources. The challenges of 2020 have also created significant opportunities. Australia Post has helped businesses small and large pivot online, which protected thousands of jobs provided access to new markets, and we play a critical role in the digital economy and the growth of e-commerce, which is vital to the support of Australia's economic recovery post-COVID-19. I'm incredibly proud of our people and their ability to adapt during these unprecedented and challenging times, ensuring many businesses across the country were able to remain trading and customers receive their vital products with our delivery operations continuing throughout 2020 and our post offices stayed open so communities could access important services. This remains the case even today with so many areas in New South Wales and Queensland flood affected our thoughts are with those communities and with our people in those areas. Our post offices remain open and we continue delivering where it is safe to do so. Through bushfires, floods and even a pandemic, Australia Post can be counted on to serve the community. It's a role we take incredibly seriously. Chair, thank you. We now stand by to answer your questions. Thank you. Before we move to questions, could I just check that no member of the committee has an objection to the media doing their role? There being none, gentlemen, feel free within the normal constraints. And uh, just noting that we have a large list of senators who wish to ask questions. I will be allocating time in blocks and moving the call between parties in the room. Did you wish to make a comment, Senator Kitchen? I would like uh, Mr Boyes to table his statement. If you could table your statement, please, Mr yeah. Boyes. Thank you. Thank could you, you do much. that now so that they can yeah. photocopy it? I believe it's already been. Thank, Thank you. you. Senator yes. Green, you have the call. Thank you very much. Um, I just want to take you to a question on notice. It's number 3003. It was asked on the 10th of February and due on the 10th of March, uh, but it hasn't been answered yet. Um, why is that? Uh, Senator, thank you very much for the question. I am not sure of question number 303. I might just ask Mr McDonald, our legal counsel, to come to the table and, uh, and respond accordingly. It relates to workers' compensation claims. Okay. You've had it since February. There should be yeah. someone in the room who can answer the question. Yes, thank you. Mr McDonald will come to the... Uh, Nick McDonald, General Counsel and Corporate Secretary of Australia Post. Uh, thank you for your question, Senator. Uh, that particular question on notice uh, has been submitted in draft to the department uh, for review. So, as I understand it, that is still going through the review process with the department before clearance um, for, su for um, submission. Mr Windy, where's, where's it up to? Why haven't we received this information? Uh, Senator, I will... Um, have to check with um, our people to work out where it is in the system, but I'm happy to do so and come back to you. All right. Well, the question relates to workers' compensation claims. Um, important information, uh, that's why we put it on notice in February. Mm -hmm. um, how many workers' compensation claims have been received um, by Australia Post that identify the temporary regulatory relief or the alternate day delivery model as a contributing factor to an injury? Sorry, Senator, I'm just trying to find a copy of the draft response. All right. Uh, <clears throat> so this draft response was submitted on the 4th of March, and as I noted before, it hasn't been 
uh, through the department review process. Um, That's okay. I'm asking you that question now because yep. it's taken uh, too long. So now I've got to put them all, all right. in the room. So the answer to that question, 17 claims had been received by 31 January that identified temporary regulatory relief and or the alternative delivery model in their claim description. Generally, this involves a claimant being of the view that they have been injured as a direct result of their role being changed by application of temporary regulatory relief and or implementation of the alternative delivery model. Okay, so there's a, they've said that there's an impact of the changes um, that's caused or been in, a part of the injury. Um, does that relate to physical injuries, psychological injuries? Is there a percentage you can break that down for me? Uh, certainly, Senator. 35.3% uh, of the claims related to physical injuries and 64.7% of the claims related to psychological injuries. So if I could just add, Australia Post has a, an extremely large workforce of over 35,000, um, around 10,000 in, in posties. And as per my opening statement, we've had a reduction of over 40% of serious motorcycle incidents um, and injuries since uh, July 2020. So serious um, incidents are down 40% uh, relating to motorcycles since July 2020. Mr Boyes, that information is not relevant to the questions that I'm asking. Um, okay. At least 64% of the people who've made claims um, in relation to these changes have suffered psychological injuries as a result of changes that you've implemented. That's what I'm asking about, okay? So just to be clear. Um, of the claims received, what is the acceptance rate or at initial liability? Uh, the acceptance rate at initial liability for those claims was 100% of the claims that related to physical injuries, uh, other than one whose outcome is still pending, uh, that were accepted at initial liability. And of the psychological injury claims, 9.1% were accepted at initial liability. Okay. We we're only talking about 17 people, so what does that equal in terms of the ones that have been rejected? Uh, We've got a table there. That'll be 15, I would say. 15 have been rejected or accepted? Okay, 17 claims. Oh, sorry. So it's 17 claims in total, 64.7 mm. uh, related to psychological injuries. Yep. And of that 64.7%, 9.1% uh, were accepted at initial liability. So I haven't done the calculations okay, in my head. Okay, so the majority so. of people who made psychological injury claims, their claims have been rejected initially? Yes, All right. that's correct, in respect of these claims. Okay. Have there been any internal directions in any form uh, issued to the workers' compensation section in Australia Post to systematically decline workers' compensation claims that identify the temporary regulatory relief or the alternate day delivery model as a contributing factor to the injury? Um, according to the draft response I've been provided, no such directives have been issued. Uh, you have been proactively included as a contributing factor that's been assessed? Uh, I'm not in a position to answer that question. Uh, Sorry, my I'd... question goes to any directions in um, Australia Post, whether it's formal or informal conversation that might have been had or something mm. in writing. Uh, and you've just sort of um, uh, couched that question, uh, answer at the beginning by saying it's not in that draft mm. response. I, I just want the answer yep. to the question. Right. So not what's in front of you, but, but what in okay. reality have there been any directions? Thank you, Senator. Yep. So I'm responding on the basis of our draft response to the question on notice. Uh, this draft response has been based on information provided to my office by various people within the organisation. Uh, in terms of further questions beyond those responses, uh, we do have somebody uh, with us today, Sue Davies, our EGM of People and Culture. Uh, she may be able to provide more information, uh, if you wish. Where is she? Uh, behind me. So I can step back. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So 
put the same question to you, Ms Davies. Has there been an internal direction about accepting or not accepting claims uh, that list uh, these two items as a cause, a contributing factor to the injury? So Susan Davies, Executive General Manager, People and, and mm. Culture. Um, in, in answer to that question, <coughs> Senator, in, in my role, that's what the injury management uh, and workers' comp uh, process sits in, in my area. When we were asked that question, I did some extensive questioning um, mm. of, of the uh, department, and to, to my knowledge, there has been no formal or informal instruction to reject claims. Okay. Um, sometimes a, a direction, that might not be the best way of explaining it, because I guess a direction is quite, is quite formal. Um, it's a, um, something that needs to be followed by employees. Um, is there anything else in the way that these claims are being processed that might contribute to, uh, in the first instance, them being rejected? Um, I'm talking about the form that might be filled out, the way that they're processed, um, uh, something that would mean that when a claim is uh, considered, um, that it essentially is funneled towards not being accepted in the first instance. So, um, Senator, all claims, um, employees are uh, able to record all claims online. So yeah. there's, there's nothing different in, in the approach of logging a physical claim to a psychological claim. Um, we have around 1,500 workers' comp claims um, received each year. Um, and I note in the, the earlier uh, conversation, at, at any moment in time, we've got about 2,500 uh, active claims when we're, we're trying to engage with 1,000 employees to, to get them back to work. Um, the acceptance rates over the past four years haven't declined, the acceptance rates. If you look at 2017, we're at 81.6%. If you look at, at last year, there were 85.1%. So quite, quite the contrary, the acceptance rates have, have increased. Mm. Um, when you talk specifically um, around psychological claims, the nature of psychological claims are a whole lot more complex than mm. physical <coughs> injuries. Um, you know, but the, there's certainly nothing that is, is different in our process or any instructions that have been given, Senator. Okay. Yes. The, Sorry to interrupt. You just mentioned the claims, the difference in the last um, uh, period. Um, so has there been a change um, of the rate since the 1st of December 2020? You're talking about last year, but just yes. interested so in the, if, if you the look period at, in the last couple of months. Yeah. Okay. So if you look at where we are, we're obviously halfway Sorry. through um, the, the reporting year, but we're at 83.8%. Uh, um, all the other years are full year's reports, um, and typically in the second half of the year, we do actually get more workers' comp claims. A lot of our workers' comp claims relate to um, strains and sprains and uh, um, trips and falls. So mm -hmm. we see more strains and sprains that take longer to uh, recover in the, in the winter months than in the summer months. So, mm -hmm. you know, there's, there is no change in the acceptance rates. So Mr. Senator Boys, Green, I'll just finish on this last question. Last question Mr. Boys, is it a concern um, for you that to hear that some of your employees um, are suffering psychological injuries based on changes that you've introduced into the way that they work? Uh, Senator, thank you very much for that question. The uh, mental and physical well-being of uh, our very vast workforce is of utmost importance to, to us. That's why we have an extensive program around uh, our employee assistance program to support mental health and well-being um, and also through the, the workers' comp, um, the resources that uh, Ms Davies has just out outlined. So um, any aspects of, uh, of our employees' health um, as we I sit here today... I asked you a very specific question. Oh, I asked you a very specific question. There are um, employees of yours who have uh, claimed psychological injuries uh, caused by the temporary regulatory relief and the alternate day delivery model. And I'm asking you, what is your view on that? And have you taken any action? Have you considered that those changes could be a contributing factor to their injuries? Uh, what consideration have you been given for senators. that? Um, as I said, we, we take the mental and physical um, uh, well-being of our employees in incredibly and seriously. Order. So yeah. we've had 
led we've had a 40 per cent reduction in serious motorcycle in injuries, That's largely as a result of That's changing to ADM. Thank you, Senator. Yeah. Um, largely as a result of changing to ADM because we've halved the number of motorcycle journeys and therefore significantly reduced that. And the psychological so, injuries? And the psychological um, impact, uh, as I said in my opening statement, Senator, we don't underestimate the impact of uh, the changes that were introduced last year uh, due to the parcel volumes and also the changes. On many of these uh, posties, this was the biggest change that they've done in 20 years. And but we a mental health injury Senator, can be much more Senator debilitating Pratt, at times Senator than a physical injury. Thank you. I'm going to give the call to Senator Van. We'll come back to the opposition. Um, a quick preamble. On, on 22nd of October, the shareholder departments commence an investigation supported by Maddox, uh, the law firm, into the gifting of uh, Cartier watches to four executives at post in November 2018. The investigation was completed uh, on 20th of November last year, made 12 findings. Mr Boys, what changes has Australian Post made following that investigation? Uh, thank you, Senator, for that question. Um, Senator, we, we didn't wait for the investigation, frankly. Um, uh, we, on the 22nd of, of October, we launched our own internal review of a large number of processes um, from those that were raised on the events of the 22nd. Um, uh, we had around uh, 32 findings, if I, if I recall collect, correctly, uh, that came out of that review, largely around the use of credit cards, um, gifts, benefits, hospitality uh, and reward and recognition. And uh, I'm very pleased to say that we've implemented already 26 of those recommendations um, and uh, the, the remaining ones are in the process of being implemented. So that's of our internal review. Um, and the findings of the Maddox report, which we received some time later, um, largely uh, concurred with our own internal findings. And uh, so we've re removed a number of credit cards. We've lowered uh, limits on other credit cards. We've removed the office of the CEO credit card, for example. Um, we've tightened up on our reward and recognition policy and we've introduced lower limits. Uh, we already had limits for gifts, benefits and hospitality uh, declaration. We've lowered those limits considerably um, uh, in, in recent months. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Senator McKenzie. Uh, thank you very much. In the same block of time. Questions for the Chair of Australia Post. Um, thank you for your attendance. Um, on the 22nd of October, you released a statement that Group CEO and Managing Director Christine Holgate would stand aside during the investigation into the proper use of public resources at Australia Post. On the 29th of October, the Australian Financial Review reported that Ms Holgate's lawyers said she'd not been officially informed of a four-week suspension. The article also states that Ms Holgate was, and I quote, stood down. Can you please clarify whether Ms Holgate was suspended from the role or if her employment was terminated by Australia Post? Thank you, Senator. Um, the short answer is that she stood aside during the course of the four-week investigation, as it was identified at that time. Um, that came about after a number of discussions on the afternoon of the 22nd of October, <coughs> where the board, <coughs> excuse me, the board met uh, that afternoon to consider the issues that had been identified. Uh, over a number of discussions that I had with uh, uh, Christine Holgate, uh, we advised her that we wished her to stand aside while this investigation took place. She was clearly reluctant to do so initially, but over a number of discussions, she ultimately agreed late that afternoon that she would stand aside. And, uh, and uh, in fact, we announced that we would appoint Rodney as an acting uh, group general, uh, group, gen uh, group CEO, uh, and, uh, and advised her accordingly that afternoon. So she's currently stood aside? No, no, no. Uh, that was on the 22nd of October. On the 2nd of November, uh, we, the board, received an email from Christine uh, offering to stand aside. Uh, sorry, uh, to stand aside with the language sorry. is really important Thank you, pardon. She's currently standing aside. So, sorry, my, my fault. She emails you and says... She emailed us on the 20... Uh, 20 uh, sorry, the 2nd of November mm -hmm. and offered her resignation. 
uh, effective immediately. And uh, we uh, met, considered her position, and responded back uh, that afternoon and uh, accepted her resignation. So and, and so has not been an employee of Australia Post since the afternoon of the 22nd of October. Seven. Sorry, 2nd of, uh, of November, beg your pardon. Yes, let's get, get our um, facts straight. So when, it, when the um, Australian Financial Reviews article on the 29th of October said um, that she had not received proper notification um, that she'd been stood down from her role when, you, when she'd stood aside, um, nor informed as to why she should be stood down during the investigation. Um, her lawyers also said in that article that she had not had any communication regarding the investigation into Australia Post from either the board or the government. How do you respond to those claims in the Australian Financial Review <coughs> article? Well, taking them one at a time. The first was that we actually followed up the verbal discussions that I was having with Christine that afternoon and, and uh, an agreement reached that she would stand aside with a letter. And I believe, uh, and I'll confirm, I think that was sent on the 24th of October, 25th of October, beg your pardon, uh, that confirmed the arrangements that we'd, uh, we had struck on the 22nd. Uh, so, so, sorry, that was in writing or that was in a writing. conversation? No, no, in writing. The 22nd was all, all the conversations conversation. were, were, took place during the course of board meetings and breaks yep. in board meetings. That was confirmed uh, on the 25th in writing to her. Uh, we made public statements on the evening of the 22nd, uh, effectively announcing her standing aside at that time as well. Okay. Um, could you provide the Senate committee um, with copies of those communications on notice? Uh, yes. Um, Thank you. We. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I just now want to turn to um, the report into the investigation into the proper use of public resources in Australia Post report. Um, finding six states that there is no indication of dishonesty, uh, fraud, corruption or intentional misuse of Australia Post funds by any individual involved in the matters relating to the purchase and gifting of Cartier watches. Finding eight then says, uh, the then board did not consider or approve the purchase of the Cartier watches and that there was contradictory evidence as to um, whether former group CEO and managing director informed the chair that it was her intention to purchase the Cartier watches or whether the former chair approved the commitment of funds for this purchase. No definitive fine can be made in this regard. That's directly quoting uh, from the findings. So who approved the purchase of the watches? Uh, well, uh, clearly the watches were bought and approved under the direction of Christine Holgate. Uh, Christine, in her Evidence says that she did so after discussing the matter with the chair. That's obviously a matter in dispute. And we have so no you're, you're telling us, you're telling Senate Estimates Committee that you did not approve... Uh, sorry. ..or did not know that uh, Holgate was going to purchase these watches? Uh, for clarity, this was in 2018. I was not the chair. Oh, sorry. That so chair the chair at, of the day, the in evidence, said that he was not aware that she was going to buy these Cartier watches uh, as a was he recognition aware, reward. Was he aware that um, she was going to buy watches or a gift? Uh, I can only go by the, the report that you quoted earlier. Uh, and, and my understanding of his evidence was that he was not aware. Right. Finding um, nine says that the per and I quote again, the purchase of the Cartier watches was inconsistent with the obligation imposed by the PGPA Act on the board relating to the proper use and management of public resources <coughs> and inconsistent with public expectations in relation to the use of public resources. So what has been done um, at Australia Post? Um, has any action against uh, the board or how have we changed processes 
to ensure that this doesn't happen again. Um, as uh, our uh, CEO uh, outlined in his response just earlier, uh, we immediately did a review of all credit cards, their use, the policies, procedures standing behind it, and identified 32 opportunities to enhance what was there. And uh, many of those opportunities have been enhanced <coughs> and put in place. Furthermore, when the report was finally concluded, it identified further actions to be taken, and likewise, they are being uh, actioned as we speak. Matthew, the last question in this uh, bracket, Senator McKinson. Chair, I've got. I've, I wrote to the committee to request that the chair appear. I've got a series of questions and the going chair won't to be going the BCG anywhere strategic under standing review orders, Senator report. McKenzie. Senator McKenzie, I'm speaking. I'd ask you to do me the courtesy of listening. The chair will not be going anywhere until you've finished asking your questions, but it will go. Got it. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Final question in this series. Um, finding 9D in relation to the Office of the CEO credit card refers to the board as the accountable authority. Um, given this responsibility and other findings I've referred to within this report, why was Ms Holgate stood aside? Um, she I'm asking the chair. Okay. The board... Because the Prime Minister didn't have these conversations. The, the, the chair had time. these conversations. What else are they do? Why was Christina Holgate stood aside, given the findings of this report? The board elected to stand Christine Holgate aside on the afternoon of the 22nd of October on the basis that the, uh, the shareholders had asked the departments to undertake an investigation of the matters that had come to light in that Senate estimates earlier that day. And in light of the investigation that was going to take place, it was appropriate that Christine stand aside so as to ensure the clear and impartial review and, and non, you know, the influence that might otherwise have occurred or the, the perception that the influence might have occurred if she was still in the role. So she was standing aside. Uh, it was no more, no less than that. So the Senator, shareholder ministers Senator called McKenzie, you that was your last and question made you for this stand block. her down. Senator McKenzie. No. That was your last question for this block. Senator Kitching, you have the call. Thank you, Chair. Um, hello and welcome. Um, could I just ask some follow-up questions to Senator McKenzie? I'm not doing it in order to. <laughs> but I just want to just clarify some things. Did Ms Holgate receive severance pay? No. No severance, not even of entitlements? Sorry. Not even a, a oh. watch, a going by watch. Um, not she, even she of Sorry, she received her due annual leave entitlements, yes, uh, and no, no, nothing else. Uh, she certainly received no incent. Uh, uh, so she, she doesn't, thank you. Yeah. So she doesn't have an email account anymore? I don't believe she has. No, no. email okay. account, um, she has a personal so, And she's not account. on the books in any way? In any way. And what was the last, what was the date, and you happy to take, I'm happy for you to take this on notice. What is, what's the date on which uh, Ms Holgate uh, signed documents for Australia Post? I will, I'm happy, I, will, yeah. I will, will take that on notice. Thank you. Um, is it possible you can table, I think in response to Senator McKenzie, you said there were, you found 32 opportunities to enhance. Correct. What did you call, what did you call the document? Well, it was just an internal uh, process Re we review that we under undertook the following. The yeah, so no, can, a are you able to, talk, to table that document? And I would like it to include the 32 opportunities for enhancement. We'd take that yeah, on notice. Yep. Thank yeah. you. Thanks, Mr McDonald. Um, could I ask the acting chief fi group financial, the acting group chief financial officer to the table? Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Silvio Santos Stefano, Acting Group, Chief Financial Officer. Thank you. Is this your first estimates? Yes, it is. <laughs> um, how long have you been employed in financial management positions at Australia Post? Uh, just over six years now. Six years. So what was your position before your current position? I was the Chief Financial Officer for the commercial part of the business. Um, 
In, can I ask you, just in preparation of the fourth quarter 2020 financial year financials, are, did you receive any specific instructions from either Mr Boys or were there, was there any discussion in particular to that quarter's financial reporting? Sorry, I'm not sure I understand the question. Well, I mean, when I look at those, um, there's a lot of write-downs in... You obviously wrote down some of the some of the income. I wanted. Can you take me through where you wrote where you were doing the writing downs? Well, in any in any given financial year, we obviously have a review of all of our assets and liabilities. Yes. And so, what the, did you do? Did you just use simple depreciation, or did you? Well, depending on what particular asset you're So, where you're did you write to. down? Which areas did you write down in in know, the assets? Um, Get a copy of the annual report. The well, I've got the 2020, so the, if you've got a copy the, of it... In the annual report? Yes, um, but what I want to know is where you wrote, where you were writing down and were there particular... Were there any that were unusual from past years? Not to my knowledge, no. So where did... In the assets... Let's take assets for a start. What did you write down? Well, again, depending on the asset or the investment being made and the useful life and its economic returns, we would make judgments at each year end in terms of whether an asset needs to be written off or not. So maybe I can put it this way. Was the value of the write-down, the amount of the write-down, was it uh, greater than sort of usual depreciation measures? Not to my knowledge, no. OK. Senator, so our um, accounts are audited by uh, the Australian National Audit Office. There no, and I see... And we comply with the accounting standards and produce a very detailed annual report. Um, and I've just seen... I've never acted for a government-owned enterprise, so I've, I've just seen what your accounting standards, what you report to, yeah, so... Yeah, yeah well, all under uh, uh, general accounting standards, yes. Yeah. And, and we produce a very detailed annual report. Yes. And, and those, uh, that information is clearly in there um, and the audits undertaken by the uh, Australian National Audit Office. Yes. In compliance with those standards. Um, in the lead up to the end of the 2020 financial year, were there? Did you have? Did you discuss, decide in that last quarter to do an sort of an unusual amount of write downs? Then, uh, as I said earlier, not to my knowledge, we would in any course of any financial year towards the end of the year, we will obviously do a review of all of our assets and liabilities. And to my knowledge, the level of write-downs that you're referring to was no different to any prior year accounting adjustment. Where required. Well, that's interesting in itself because I think Mr Boy's opening statement says that 2020 was a difficult year. And you did give a number of a list of um, sort of financial so, uh, data. It was an incredibly difficult year. It was a difficult year for, for the people of particularly of Victoria. Uh, it was a difficult yes, year. Yes, thank you. <laughs> I was there with you, I Senator. Didn't know. So uh, it was a particularly difficult year. It was a challenging year with the surge of volumes that uh, that hit us, a tsunami of volumes that hit us through uh, late March, uh, April, May, and then the second lockdown in, in August. It was a difficult year because we've heard um, the changes that we went through to deal with those, uh, with yeah. those volumes. So it was a challenging year all round. Um, so in that... In that last quarter, so when you looked at that, did that year, firstly, did that make any, um, kind of want to ask, did that create any unusual activity in terms of the reporting, the finalisation of the financial year? No. No, no well, there was, um, I should, should um, <laughs> have to cast my mind back. Um, Senator, to that time, there was, there was significant vol um, uh, volatility in, um, uh, in stock markets, bond rates and, and superannuation. We have a very large superannuation asset that sits um, for our defined benefit fund. Uh, it's over $800 million that sits on our balance sheet. Um, coming to a, at a landing on that, um, actuarial reviews were incredibly difficult. Uh, we have a substantial property portfolio. Uh, valuation is around a billion dollars. Um, so getting a handle, if you take your mind back to June last year, it was an incredibly volatile uh, period of time across all markets. Um, and for the auditors uh, to come to a landing on the value of those assets. Uh, so it was a challenging area because of the volatility of the markets uh, at that time. Did you keep... Can I ask, just on back on the write-downs, and did you keep records of that? Did you keep records of the discussion you had? I presume you've got a finance committee 
that's so the, 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 the results, the outcomes of the uh, any changes that were made uh, through the end of the year, obviously the end of uh, financial year, is uh, there's a lot of audit papers that are gone through by the uh, Australian National Audit Office and, and um, EY on their behalf. Um, those audit papers are very detailed and cover off things like the superannuation valuation, the property valuations, um, any asset reviews and, and valuations, goodwill revaluations, anything uh, in that nature, as they do for our provisions. We have a significant um, provision for long service leave for things like workers' comp and annual leave. They all have to uh, uh, to be viewed and um, uh, and reviewed by the by the auditors. So there was no specific instruction to identify write downs. You didn't. There you is would have been every seen. year as part of the accounting status. We have an obligation, not an but instruction, nothing... um, Senator. We have an obligation. Um, under the accounting standards, to report our assets at uh, at fair value. That, that's 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 not so. You, that's law. Are you, so they weren't. There was. They, they were in no way unusual. There wasn't an unusual request. You were looking for write downs as you normally do. There is you, a review of the uh, carrying value of all of our assets and um, the carrying value of our provisions. Um, uh, on, on every every line item on our balance sheet um, has to be reviewed. Um, it is reviewed um, in a normal process. We do that in a normal process. And, and as I say, point out, it's under the accounting standards. We're governed under the accounting standards and uh, our accounts are audited um, by the ANAO or by EY on behalf of the ANAO and they issue an audit report and our financial statements are tabled in Parliament, I think, in October this year. So there was the no attempt to devalue the business or to <coughs> downgrade the value of the business? Uh, Senator, so that's not that would be outside the accounting standards. Well, it would also be against the law, but Which that's right. Yes, yeah, correct. Yeah. Are you able to? Um, so the ANAO are your external auditors. ANAO is the auditors appointed to Australia Post, and they um, uh, they outsource that through to uh, EY Ernest Young. And how does it? EY. I mean, you were I'm you were back. sorry. What was that? The did you say EY? It used to be Ernest Young. It's now EY. Right. Yes. Yes, it is. Um, I think it's so they can fit it on the tops of their buildings. <laughs> um, can you just give me a sort of an outline of how the reporting structure works? So, um, so for example, you, Mr. Santa Stefano, you were reporting to Mr. Boys. Mr. Boys, you were reporting to Christine Holgate. Is that have I basically got? that correct? And who else, how many direct reports are in the financial group, in the, in that, in that group? Um, so if we're, if we're talking for the 30th of June um, yes, year, yeah. um, I became well, acting, like to know if acting group chief executive and yeah. managing director on the 22nd of October. So at the 30th of June and for the uh, accounts uh, up until they were tabled in parliament in October, um, I was the, the CFO. Yeah. Uh, reporting to me at that time were a number of people, in including Mr. Santa Stefano, um, who looked after the commercial um, operations side, uh, Simon, Simon Camel, who looks after most of the financial accounting, um, and then there's Treasury and um, uh, Property and a number of other functions that report into Senator me. Senator Kitchen, you can make this your oh, last question for this yeah, broker, thank please. you. Um, and yes, I reported to Christine Holgate at that time. Sorry, Senator. I wonder, just so, how does that how does that body then report? Is that reported directly through the um, through Ms. Holgate at the time to the board? Is that how that is reported uh, to the board? Um, uh, our board has a number of subcommittees. One of those subcommittees is an audit and risk committee. The uh, audit and risk committee has, has a, a chair. Um, the accounts are considered by the audit and risk committee, and the audit and risk committee. Um, endorses those for approval by the board. So it goes through the Audit and Risk Committee. Okay. Okay, well, thanks very thank much. You. Senator thanks. McKenzie, you have the call for another 10 minutes. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I'd like um, the Chair back at the table, please. I want to move to the BCG Strategic Review of Australia Post, announced obviously by Minister Fletcher and former Minister Cormann as shareholder ministers. Um, stating it would, and I quote, inform the incoming chair and further informs the board's chief executive officer and would review Australia's post strategy 
to operate as a sustainable and fit for purpose service provider for the longer uh, term. The re review was announced around your appointment as chair, wasn't it? Correct. Um, so when was that exactly? Mm, late November. Exactly. I'll refer to. I'll have to refer to. Uh, someone, someone could get the exact date. I Please. understand, Senator McKenzie, it was yeah. commissioned in October 2019, but I don't know the exact date. Okay. Some, we've got enough boffins with folders here to find the exact dates, I'm sure. So if we could find both the appointment of the chair and the um, date and also the review date, that would be very, very helpful. I, I want to understand why the review has not been released publicly. Uh, Senator, may I step in on that one? Well, I would like the chair to answer, give uh, me his perspective. The review was not conducted for Australia Post. It was conducted for the shareholders. Uh, when I was first uh, invited to join the board by the minister, he clearly advised me that they were going to take an, un an independent review of Australia Post. So uh, I'm sorry, yes. Minister Fletcher. OK. Uh, and it was in, it was, I think there was this, specific concern about the long-term financial sustainability of Australia Post in light of the trends that we've spoken of for some time, declining letters, etc., and profitability had been mm. declining for some time. Um, and he advised me that uh, they were going to get BCG to do this review, and uh, I advised him that uh, while it was being done by them for uh, the shareholders, uh, we would support the review in all manners possible and give whatever information. And I made that a significant priority within Australia Post that this wasn't something we would uh, keep at arm's length, but we would try and provide whatever information we could to you know, en enhance the review. So, um, but, but it wasn't Post for us. Yes, but you're actively involved in the review process. Um, we weren't doing the review, but we were certainly actively providing the information they yep. were seeking to allow them to you know, yep. undertake the through proper review. Um, access so to if, financial records, or, or, or whatever they statistical ev Yeah, everything. So if I could go back to your earlier question, if oh, that's yes. okay. I, I was appointed on the 14th of November. Great. And uh, the review. Yeah. And the review commenced about that time. <laughs> I think that was announced on the 1st of November. Right. So I assume it didn't start prior to that. Um, so when uh, your involvement in the review process was as um, helpful as possible? Yes. So have you uh, read the final report of the review? No, I haven't read the final report of the view review. Have we... you read the draft of the final report? Well, we've read a draft. We've been shown a draft that was mm -hmm. shared with us. Whether that was the final draft, whether there were changes made, don't know because we haven't seen the final review. Right. So um, when did you get a copy of the final draft? Uh, again, take that on notice. It was, it was, would have been uh, early February, late February. In, yep. Okay. About that period. All right. Um, that would have had a lot of helpful things, I guess, um, if we're looking at the future sustainability of Australia Post. Um, have you lifted anything from it anyway? It's not Some of the appropriate findings? for anybody from Australia Post to speak to the contents of that report. I'm so asking an pansy. independent agency minister yes. a question. But the report is the property of the shareholder departments, not Australia I'm Post. Not so it's for inappropriate for all the employees of Australia Post to speak I'm to its contents. I'm not asking contents. for the report, Minister. I'm asking an independent agency uh, if there were any helpful suggestions in a, a document they may have read in February that they've chosen to implement in their organisation. We, what BCG did was a twofold. They shared their experiences of post, uh, postal services around the world, uh, the sort of uh, options that they have been taken up, many dealing with the same fundamental um, uh, patterns in the, in the marketplace with declining letters and increasing, uh, increasing volumes. And what I recall was that they, they identified a number of potential options of actions that could be taken, uh, not aware of any option being recommended. In fact, I, what I saw had no recommendations, just yep. simply said, if you did this, this would happen. Um, 
We have not taken up the specifics at all. We did some work uh, following that with uh, McKinsey's to help us in preparing our own work. Yep. Uh, awaiting for any decision that might come from government. And uh, that's what's been driving us to this point in time. So the McKinsey piece, is that completed? Yes. Yep. Yes. Yep. Okay, and you're, you're, I'm assuming you're not standing still waiting for this review to be released. You're getting on with the business well, of running uh, Auspost. That's right. I understand. And we are you using the McKinsey piece to inform your strategic direction? Uh, we are certainly using information they provided to help us come to conclusions on different matters, how we could perform our task more effectively and efficiently in particular. And, uh, you know, the issues of uh, automation in our, in our depots, uh, the sort of uh, all the equipment we use, what are, what are other postal services around the world using, to what extent can they be utilised to become more efficient in the way we deliver our services. And, uh, and they were inputs into our, what was defined as our corporate plan yeah. uh, last year, which we put forward as a, as a uh, draft in June, as per normal, and finally approved in, in August. Okay. Um, I know you've read a, a, a draft in February of the review. Yes. Mr Boyes, have you read a final, final draft or the final report? Uh, Senator, thank you for the question. Um, I'm not sure what version of the report that I read, but I, did, I have read one that's labelled draft. Uh, and was that the after time. February? No. There's nothing There's later than February? Time. And not to your way. knowledge, has anyone in your organisation read a draft report of the review of a later iteration? I... Um, I'd have to take that on notice, but not yeah. that I'm aware of. Okay. I mean, the, the, we, we received a report that we, we understand was in the later stages of the completion by yep. BCG, and that's... that's and you, your that McKinsey work been... is based on that reading no, of that report? No, the McKinsey report uh, didn't... McKinsey didn't see the BCG report. No, no, I know McKinsey didn't. You did. And um, then, you, then you commissioned McKinsey's. So... When was McKinsey commissioned to do their piece of work? Uh, I have to take that question on notice, um, okay. uh, Senator. Uh, McKinsey um, uh, piece of work is uh, an independent piece of work that Australia Post commissioned ourselves. Yes, yes, yes no, uh, I, I recognise that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm just interested in the timing. Um, so did the draft report you see, when you mentioned automation, uh, suggest cutting jobs, cutting services, divesting your parcels... Um, section. Uh, I don't believe it's uh, it's appropriate for me to comment on a report uh, for government. I think uh, government has uh, claimed a public um, immunity claim on that report. Um, I don't think it's appropriate that I comment on that. So you can't tell the Senate whether the draft review that you looked at suggested cutting jobs, services, or divesting of your parcels division. So Senator McKenzie, Mr. I've got Boyce one more has question. highlighted the fact that uh, a claim was made okay. and accepted by the committee. Uh, so please okay. continue. Thank you, Chair. Um, did the report indicate that services and deliveries to rural and regional and remote Australians are loss making, and that they should be reduced or cut Senator, to ensure I'd, the sustainability I'd, of Australia Post? I'd, I don't think it's uh, appropriate that I comment that uh, was a report commissioned I'll by government the and the. Are the, are, um, the AusPost's services to rural, and regional and remote Australia loss-making? Uh, services to rural and... Australia Post, um, in the, our annual report, um, outlines um, our, the cost of our community service obligations, the cost of the community service obligations, uh, which includes things like a universal stamp price across the country. Uh, last year it was reported, I think, at $391 million was the cost of our community service obligations. In that, the substantial amount uh, was uh, regional and rural Australia. Um, I don't have the number off the top. If somebody's got an annual report, um, Sylvia? Someone should have your annual I've, report. I've got it. Thank you, Mike. If you can make this the last question of this bracket, thanks, Senator McKenzie. So, while you're getting that annual report, Mr. Boyce, are, are you? Is it your evidence that 
um, the services and deliveries in regional, rural and remote Australia for Australia Post are a loss-making enterprise? Part of your enterprise? Uh, just, uh, sorry, I'll, sorry, uh, I'll yes come back no, to that. Uh, page 139 of uh, the Australia Post annual report for uh, 2020 uh, sets out the cost of our CSO obligations. The cost of providing the CSO for 2019-2020 is estimated at 393.3 million. Uh, last, the prior years was 392.2 million, including 201.6 million in rural and remote locations, which was up from 187. Um, I will point out that that is the uh, cost associated with our um, CSO. Um, Australia Post now operates uh, or has around 80% of its revenues coming from non-regulated um, uh, sectors, uh, predominantly in, in parcels, but also in financial services um, and, and other areas. So that is the cost of the regulated service and the community service obligation the associated services with that. piece was a very successful outcome driven by the previous Sorry. CEO, Senator Christina Holgate, McKenzie. wasn't it? Please yes, answer that no. question. I'm, I'm waiting for the chair. Sorry. Oh, um, Finish uh, your answer and then we go to Senator Kitchen. That's right. So the Banker Post refresh uh, which took place was uh, and Australia Post has been doing financial services in regional and rural Australia for over 100 years. Um, no, I know I'm from rural so. and regional Australia. Yeah, you so used to only use the Commonwealth you. Bank. Thank you. But Thank you. thanks to the former so. CEO and Chair, I do note that you were nodding to my question, um, you, that it Senator was your former CEO who really revolutionised financial services. Senator McKenzie, Thank you. Senator Kitching, you now have the call. Thank you, Chair. Um, Senator McKenzie's question reminds me of something I wanted to ask you, Mr Boyce, from your opening statement, which is you said um, after a credit rating downgrade in November 2019, blah, 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 um, although it is, this is still well below the profit levels before the credit downgrade. Um, when was, what was the credit downgrade? What was the credit rating downgrade? So, uh Australia Post uh, is, is uh, required to raise its own finances as yes. a GBE, and therefore we have an external credit agency um, do a credit rating so that we can raise debt. We have over a billion dollars in debt um, at Australia Post. Um, Standard and Poor's is, uh, is a worldwide accredited yeah, yeah. agency, it's yeah. Standard and Poor's or S&P SP Global. Um, it does a rating of Australia Post each year, and in 2019 they downgraded Australia Post uh, to the lowest possible um, that a GBE can be, and also put us on negative watch. Um, so, in, and, and that was based on a number of years of of growing debt and declining profits. Um, in FY18, uh, put, to put that in perspective, our half year profit. So comparable to the 166 was over 240 million dollars, and in FY17, I think it was 187 okay, so million. So right, okay. we went so from you, there to to I full ask, year profits of low 50s. Because the BCG report was in that year in 2019, that you were saying that there was a in your opening statement you says there's a, there's a credit rating downgrade in November 2019. Was the BCG report done partly in response to that? I'll have to ask the departments or the ministers to take that question. No, we have no idea why they commissioned that report. I can't answer that, Senator Kitching. What I can say is that these sorts of reports are in the normal business of government. No, no, I understand that. I'm just asking what my question was, was that was the BCG report done in response to a credit rating downgrade? No, I I'm can't, happy. I'm happy for you to take it on notice. I so you'll take it on notice. I can take that on notice. Um, did the BCG report propose to privatise a parcels business? I'm sorry, you're asking me that question? I think we're well, going to I'm take a public interest anyone... immunity claim on the, on the BCG report and its contents. Right. Oh, so you are making it right now. You're we making the claim now. Oh, my God, that's so good. Senator Kitching, it um, was it yes, I made do. previously and accepted. Right, OK. No, no. I'm, thank you, Chair. Thanks. Um, so maybe I can't ask about, maybe the public interest immunity claim won't extend to um, the cost of the report, which I understand was $1.3 million. Is that correct? I can't answer that question. I can take it on notice, but I would, again, well, now note I'm going to ask that Mr. These, Boys a commissioning question. these reports uh, is in the normal course of government, and it was um, yeah, yeah. No, done against... by the two shareholder departments. Yes. Could I ask you, Mr. Boys, did Australia Post pay for that report through a special dividend? Uh, 
Uh, Senator, thank you for the question. Um, my understanding is this was covered at the Senate spill on the 9th of November um, and in a subsequent question on notice. Um, we were asked uh, by the government for a special dividend um, and it did note that um, those uh, that the special dividend was to go towards the cost of uh, the BCG report. Um, I think that his question has already been tabled. How, uh, but no, no, as no, to no, the total you. cost of the report, that wasn't. Um, so uh, how much we did the special dividend? How much was the special dividend? Uh, I will get the exact number. I think it was 1.38 oh, million. I think it was 1.38 there oh. thereabouts. <laughs> thereabouts. Um, 1 now, can I just ask you, Mr. Di Bartolomeo? I just want to clarify just some. Um, just some questions in relation to the write downs. Um, were, so, are all, when you're making those decisions in relation to write downs, when the Australia Post is making those decisions, are they documented or are they sometimes um, just conversations? Uh, it may be best for. Yeah, I'm happy. Uh, for, yes. I'd, for thank you, sir. Running to answer that. Uh, for Mr. that. De Bartolo, just sorry, Mr. Boyd. Do you sit on the Risk and Audit Committee? I don't sit as as a chair. You, you're a ex officio on all committees. Is that how you do it? Correct. Yes. So I attend all meetings, but I'm not a member yes. of those committee thank meetings. You. Yes. Thank you. Thanks. Um, Senator, thank you for the question. Uh, page uh, 103 of the Australia Post annual report. Am I in the 2020, 2020 So sorry, 100 and, report. did you say page 103? Page 103. Oh, I don't. Sets out the um, uh, expenses uh, for the year, um, including our, our salary and wages. And so other. I'm disadvantaged because I don't have page numbers, but I'm in the notes to the okay. financial statements? Yes. Is that where I am? You're in the notes to the financial statements, correct. Um, I, 103. 103. Thank you. What's the heading? Uh, expenses A2. Why don't you continue and I'll try and find... So that sets out all of the uh, the main uh, expense categories as required under the accounting standards. Included in that is, is an impairment of, of assets, which is uh, changes in the value of receivables. Um, uh, back at that time, just as there was significant fluctuations in things like uh, property and, uh, and you, bond you're rates. Seeing a, you're seeing a little bit of bipartisan oh, I, activity I, here. I <laughs> there you go. Oh, I could have let <laughs> you my copy. Oh, my apologies. Um, I think, I think, uh, so um, included in there is a write down of receivables. So receivables, uh, yeah. we have a, large, a very large uh, uh, outstanding um, customer um, debtor book um, at uh, uh, 20 um, 30th of June 2020, um, as most organisations were facing, it was a very uncertain future, um, and so we I increased the provision for our doubtful debts, um, uh, which in the previous year was 1.6 million to 20.1, or up by 20.1 million. Um, inventory, property, plant and equipment, and uh, I think you were questioning around property, plant and equipment and computer software earlier, Senator. Um, I have the report. Property plant equipment was 9.5 this year versus 7.8 last year, so not substantially different. Um, and in fact, computer software was 1.2 this year versus 5.8 yeah. last year. Um, on the earlier page um, is the. Sorry, can I just ask? Are you using under? Are you using a, um, a three-year depreciation period? Um, each asset uh, under the accounting standard okay. has to be written down over the useful life of that asset. Okay, that's how. Yeah. Okay. Um, I was going to ask you, just bear with me for a moment. Um, so there was no attempt. So there is no there is no attempt to avoid identifying write downs. So you you it's a fully disclosed it it's is. fully disclosed. No, no, we have, but there's um, no. But do you do that in writing amongst yourselves, or do you do it? Is there, are there conversations around write downs and looking for write downs in order to devalue the business? Um, Senator, there is a set of accounting standards um, which we're obligated to comply yeah. with, um, and we go through a rigorous process, uh, a very detailed audit process. The audit is conducted by um, EY on behalf of the ANAO, and we go through that process every year. 
um, as uh, the same way that we've gone through it um, for many, many years. And Australia Post put, produces an extremely detailed um, annual report, um, and there are no differences to the annual report last year than and the process in preparing that report than there has been in previous years. Thank you. Thanks. Um, Minister, could I just ask, is it Australia Post was asked to make a special dividend payment that matches exactly with the cost of the BCG report. Is that a coincidence or was that arranged? I'm happy for you to take it on notice and ask the shareholding ministers. I'm happy to ask the shareholding ministers, but I think to imply anything other than coincidence is well, nothing more than speculation. For both. Um, could I just ask some questions? Just, I'm not sure. Do I have a few minutes left? You've got about a minute left. <laughs> Thank you. Um, could I just ask, so is the cost of the Egon Zender, uh, the executive search firm that's undertaking the search for the new, for the next CEO, yes. um, are they, how, I understand that's up to about $500,000, is that correct? Uh, I don't believe so. The initial um, cost was 320 or so thousand. 320. Um, plus GST, I think. Yes, on the service, yes. Um, now, I think there's been media reporting saying the search for the CEO has narrowed, but is that correct or is it in fact stalled? It's not stalled and the search has is reaching its final stages. And who's on the interviewing committee? I, I presume you are, Mr. Uh, it's a subset of, yes, of, the of the board. Yes. So there's myself, there's um, Deidre Wilmot. Yes. Uh, there's Andrea Staines, our Deputy yep. Chair, and Tony Nutt, four. Last question, thanks. Um, um, could, yes, so just on the expenses um, that have been undertaken, so that 320 plus GST approximately covers it, but you're expecting another another bill in from No, 320 is the, is is, the was the offer. offer. I think the only thing that might be added to if there's any specific expenses... Yes, yeah, so, and I wouldn't ask... If we ask people to travel or whatever. Right, OK. And so you're... Because the board members... Which there members probably wasn't this, a lot of. Sorry? There probably wasn't a lot of travel. <laughs> no. No, probably not. OK, thank, um, you, thank you, Senator thank Kitching. Thank Senator Small. Thanks very much. Um, Mr Boyce, uh, regulatory relief was provided to Australia Post uh, last year. Um, in, in just a very brief sense, what do you understand that to have meant for Australia Post? Uh, Senator, thank you for the question. Um, as outlined in my opening statement, it had significant um, positive benefits for Australia Post in being able to deal with uh, the surge in parcels that came immediately after the lockdown. Um, it also gave us the, the flexibility, uh, should we have needed it at the time, um, around our post office numbers. Obviously, um, in uh, March uh, last year, we were unsure about how COVID would affect um, our workforce, um, and also there was uh, there was some degree of fear with, amongst our our post office and our licensed post office staff that uh, they may not um, want to be open during that period. So it gave us some flexibility around that. Um, we were very very pleased that um, we. Uh, we're able to deploy a significant amount of uh, PPE, protective uh, equipment, out, including um, the, the screens, um, uncomfortably known as sneeze screens, um, out to our post offices um, and masks, uh, hand sanitizer and the like. Um, and so our post offices worked incredibly um, uh, diligently and tirelessly right through COVID, so we didn't take up um, that offer uh, and had to avail ourselves of temporary regulatory relief in that area. Um, Priority Mail, um, uh, Qantas had grounded its, its fleet, entire fleet at that stage. Um, uh, they are now back to around 60% um, um, of their uh, routes, uh, but that 60% is primarily the eastern seaboard. Um, we are still significantly affected on flights into regional um, uh, regional Australia, um, and also things like Greyhound buses, which carry a lot of our mail and parcels um, with no inter international tourists, um, have, uh, have been uh, ceased, so we haven't been able to, to use that service. Um, and then there was the delivery frequency and the delivery speed, and all of those um, enabled Australia Post 
supposed to redeploy um, our resources, some of our resources from letters delivery to parcels delivery, uh, and support small and large business pivot online and uh, and uh, community to get their parcels. That's been a, a very very positive outcome. So uh, if we if we take that um, that all basically as as relating to the the, the business impacts. Uh, and, and the ability of Australia Post to service customers. Do you have any other reflections on what those uh, what that transition has meant for uh, Australia Post staff? Uh, yeah, a couple of things. I, I think as we were, uh, I outlined in my um, opening statement and, and earlier in, in Senate estimates discussions. We don't underestimate the impact uh, that the transition, uh, particularly on on those uh, posties that uh, had to change their rounds or move uh, um, off a motorcycle into uh, into a higher capacity vehicle being um, the vans. Mm -hmm. um, and new, learn new rounds, new technology, scanning equipment, those sort of things. So um, there was a, a significant Im impact. Uh, we thank them and, uh, and their colleagues for, uh, for that transition because it really did serve the community. Um, uh, additionally, it enabled us to capture significant additional volume that we wouldn't have been able to do to service the community had we not been able to redeploy our resources from letters to parcels, and therefore we were able to increase our processing capacity with the pop-up sites, as I said, um, and we uh, employed an additional 5,000 uh, employees uh, over uh, the peak period to, uh, to deliver those 86 million parcels that I mentioned in my opening statement. So uh, have there been any job losses associated with that regulatory relief, notwithstanding the, the surge in employment? Uh, Senator, we, we uh, gave our uh, commitment through a memorandum of understanding um, with the unions that there would be no job losses. Um, as I, There has been no job losses and as, as I outlined, um, we were able to employ 5,000 additional people because of capturing those volumes and, uh, and being able to deliver those parcels. Mm -hmm. Um, in an ongoing sense, uh, so if we set aside the transition uh, and the support you've received from Australia Post employees through that, uh, in a, a forward-looking sense, um, would you describe the regulatory relief as affecting working conditions at Australia Post? Uh, in a forward sense, uh, my, my, my sense, uh, based on um, the feedback um, through my, my uh, uh, executive leadership team and the consultation that they've had and my personal site visits um, in recent months has suggested that um, the impacts have largely uh, been dealt with. Um, it was a, a, a period of up, upheaval but also of tremendous volume um, that came through uh, in the parcel side of the business. Um, so uh, I think we've had, uh, we've got um, uh, the most um, uh, impact is behind us. Um, however, uh, temporary regulatory relief, and we're very conscious, um, and expires on the 30th of June this year. Um, uh, we are working with our workforce and a range of stakeholders um, to understand what the community needs are going forward. Uh, as I outlined, we've had 314 million fewer letters in the last 11 months than we had the same 11 months pre-COVID. Structurally, the world has changed. 70% um, uh, of all Australian households are now shopping online. Um, uh, should we uh, be required to uh, uh, revert our workforce back into everyday delivery in particular, uh, that will have a significant detrimental impact uh, financially on the sustainability of Australia Post, but also on that workforce who has only just changed and dealt with that change. Mm. So if, uh, if Australia Post had to revert to a pre-regulatory re relief operating environment, um, can you talk more around what that would mean for the business and uh, for the Australian people that depend on its services? Um, thank you, Senator, for the, for the question. Uh, we are, we're working through uh, all of the, the potential implications of that um, as, as we speak. Um, it's, it's top of mind for Australia Post at the moment. Um, uh, first of all, uh, we've had, uh, whilst we were speaking about the credit rating down rate um, some time ago. Australia Post has been staring into these financial challenges since the peak of letters in 2008, um, mm -hmm. uh, back when letters were about 5.5 billion. Uh, we are now at about 60% of that number. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, COVID has just accelerated that from a steady decline of, of uh, around 10% to now 17.6% for the last 11 months. Uh, we would, uh, to revert back to 
uh, the everyday delivery model uh, would require a significant shift of those resources back from the profitable and growing areas of parcels to the declining and significantly loss-making areas of lettuce. Um, last year, as set out in our annual report, lettuce lost 241 million, and despite a 10 cent um, basic postage stamp, uh, effectively a stamp rise on the 1st of January this year, we lost 74 million just in the half. Um, mm. So it would have a significant detrimental uh, financial impact on, on the sustainability of Australia Post. Do you have uh, an estimation of what that what it would cost to transition back to that pre-regulatory re relief environment? Uh, Sir, thank you for the question. We, we are working through that process uh, as we speak. Um, I, I should say whilst the r regulations expire and potentially we go back, operationally w we can't go back and we, to the model that we had before. Um, we have had 314 million fewer letters than we had the same time last year. The, the world is now e-commerce and moving that direction. Um, mm. We are acutely aware of our obligations, both under the Australian Postal Corporations Act of 1989, I'll, I'll point out, an act that was uh, uh, developed uh, when the uh, internet was in its infancy, if it existed at all, um, uh, and our obligations. I was still in my infancy. <laughs> <laughs> and our obligations under the PGPA Act, uh, which we are also acutely aware uh, for the proper, uh, efficient, economic, um, and ethical use of Australia Post resources. And we need to understand what the uh, proper uh, use of Australia Post resources uh, are in, in a post COVID uh, world. Thanks, Mr. Boys. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Senator Kitching, were you seeking the call? Yes. Oh. Or Senator Pratt. Oh. Senator Kitchen, you have the call. Thank you. Thank you. Um, could I just ask, so the, the, Mr. De Bartolomeo, just the names on the uh, CEO search committee, uh, are you Ms. Wilmot, Ms. Staines and Tony Nutt? Is that correct? Four, yes. Yeah. Could I ask you, I don't know whether you have this, but could I ask you to table... Um, you know, the skills matrix of the board. So sometimes when people are doing board selections, they might say, we need the following sort of categories of, you know, someone who knows something about, you know, one thing, you might have an accountant, a lawyer sort of thing. Do you have such a matrix for the board I'm talking for about For the board, now? not the CO no, search. If, well, I'm interested in that too, but for the board I would be interested in because just the members on the CEO search committee obviously Obviously, you would want, um, the, you know, people the, who can... the, the board has just concluded an independent review of board performance, as we oh. do, and about we haven't finalised it, but it, there's a report going back to the shareholders. But one of the things it identifies is the skill mix that the Australian Post Board, we yeah. believe, needs. So when you say shareholders, you see that's to the two ministers, even though yes. obviously it's. Yeah. Uh, Acting on behalf of all shareholders, yes, yes the two right, shareholder yes. ministers, yes. Um, but that doesn't mean we necessarily see it. So what I'm really asking you is in that review I'll, of the board... I'll take that on, on yes. notice, thank you. But do you have such a, a yes. skills matrix? Yes, we have a skills matrix, yes. Okay, so in the subcommittee of the board that is um, searching, for the, searching and finding yes. a CEO, um, why, were the, why, were, why were you and Ms Wilmot and Ms Staines and Mr Nutt chosen? Well, I, I chose them, and I chose them on the basis of uh, who I thought collectively would be uh, a good representation and an appropriate committee to make that selection. At the end of the day, it's a recommendation from that committee to the board. And is every member of that subcommittee of the board keeping those deliberations about, you know, to choose the new CEO? Are they being kept absolutely confidential? Absolutely. Because obviously there are members of this subcommittee who know lots of people, including in government, and it would be, I think, improper for, um, for example, the shareholders, the shareholding ministers to, or the Prime Minister to influence that decision. S Senator, let me reassure you, the highest priority I had when we started this process is that this was going to be kept highly confidential. Uh, I was concerned about potential leaks. Uh, Why were you concerned? 
Oh, I think historically Australia Post has had leaks. Order. Uh, order. I, I'm not, <clears throat> certainly not in the time that I was, I've been there. Okay. But these are, searching for a CEO and looking for the best candidate possible uh, is a highly private and confidential matter. Yeah. Where, I where, where, order, Senator McKenzie. That's where you helpful. could lose candidates if they felt this wasn't a, 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 yes. a, a matter dealt in, the, in that, uh, with that priority. Yes. Um, it was kept very close uh, and uh, is being kept very close and it, the, the saving grace that I had is that I, I, I took some delight in reading press clippings about potential candidates <laughs> because they weren't very accurate. I understand. I, yes, I understand. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. And I might hand over Thank to you Senator There's Pratt. only two minutes in this block Chair, left. Senator Pratt. Pratt. Quick questions in relation to uh, Australia Post cancelling perishable good distribution. Can I ask very quickly? Um, sorry, I'm up to the right. Just, um, when was that decision taken, and which peak bodies for food growers? and independent food growers were consulted, cheese makers, salami makers, etc. When were they told about this? Uh, and were they consulted? Senator, thank you very much uh, for that question. Australia Post uh, operates uh, what's considered an, an ambience, a room temperature network. We don't operate refrigerated vehicles um, or refrigerated uh, premises um, to carry chilled perishable food items. Um, no, I understand uh, that, but nor does any other, every other um, delivery service necessarily. Um, Australia Post takes its legal obligations extremely uh, seriously. Um, Senator, I can't comment on, on um, other um, Is it food delivery services that you refer goods? to. So Is it illegal to transport these goods in non-refrigerated um, trucks, the noting that the onus is on the supplier to package them appropriately and take into account the timeline for delivery to the location that they've contracted Australia Post to deliver under. Uh, thank you, Senator, for the question. Uh, the food regulations, uh, particularly when it comes to chilled perishable items uh, across Australia are state-based regulations. They're extremely uh, complex. They differ by state and they differ by food group. So um, when something leaves a particular state, it might be legal. And when it enters another state, it may breach um, those local state um, laws. Um, okay, they so are your requirement so, to Senator uphold Pratt, those laws. I understand last that. Question, thanks. Your requirement to uphold those laws when delivering things, are they any different to any other non Australia Post delivery companies? And why shouldn't Australia Post? play a leadership role in ensuring goods can get to their destination rather than cancelling uh, and stopping this distribution. Surely Australia Post is the best organisation, given it's government owned, to work with the states and actually get through all of those issues. Uh, thank you, thank you, Senator. We have been working um, with the states, trying to uh, work through those particular laws. Um, uh, Australia Post uh, doesn't operate a chilled network. We don't have chilled vehicles. We don't have chilled facilities. Um, to invest in that would be a significant new line of business. Um, but are you now that saying that the non-Australia Post delivery companies? that will be delivering these goods that they do all have chilled trucks? Because I don't think that they do. Uh, Senator, I can't comment on other delivery... You can't okay, comment, Senator but so Pratt, where, other delivery Senator Pratt, where is... Senator Pratt, we the can come comment. back to you, but that is your last question. I'm going to go to Senator Roberts on a party basis. One Nation's not yet had the chance to ask questions. You have the call for five minutes. Thank you, Chair, and thank you all for attending today. Is Australia Post considering selling off its profitable parcel post business? And please advise what discussions, reviews and planning has and will occur in, in relation to the parcel post business. Senator, um, that would be a matter for government, so I would have to defer to government. If I, if I could uh, just respond from the Chair's 
and board's perspective, there has been no discussion, no plans, no undertakings to privatise any aspects of Australia Post business, certainly in the time that I've been there. And while we're on that time, can I correct a figure that I gave earlier? Uh, I was appointed on the 22nd of November, not the 14th of November. Uh, the 14th was the date that the press release was put out. I apologise for that. So you can rule out that there'll be a sale of the parcel post? Correct. Correct. Thank Senator you. I mean, I, so can I. I. Thank you. Does Australia Post consider yes. it has a responsibility to provide a, possible, a profitable business model for licensees of community post offices? Uh, we certainly believe we have a responsibility to maintain viable uh, partners in all the business that we undertake, both at the contractor level and at the LPO level, yes. So you, you will look at uh, their services through their eyes? Absolutely. The Chair of Australia Post commissioned a review by the Boston Consulting Group to inform the board and the CEO. Why were the most heavily invested stakeholder group, the licensees, not engaged and or included in the sharing of the outcomes recommendations for that review. Senator, if I could just correct one point. The Australia Post Board did not engage BCG. This was an independent investigation by our shareholders, shareholder ministers, uh, and we supported the investigation, but we did not engage nor ultimately conclude any position on, on that so review. Who do I, from whom do I request to get a copy? Because it's been uh, out since we've been taking well, public chair, interest the, immunity sorry. on that, Senator sorry? Roberts. We've already taken public interest immunity on that report, Senator Roberts. The Cabinet's explicitly considered the executive summary of the BCG report. The full report, though, as a usual practice, was also available to Cabinet and uh, considered by a number of ministers. But the report's expected to be given further Cabinet consideration in the context of ensuring that, a that Australia Post has a sustainable future. Could you please advise the status and next steps being taken by Australia Post with licensed post offices, LPOs, to protect to progress payment reforms? Uh, Senator, thank you very much for the question. I may I just uh, defer to uh, Ms Sheffield, who heads up our community and consumer area, and ask her to come to the desk um, and outline we are about to kick off on the payment uh, review process and the payment. So, uh, Ms Sheffield. Thank you, Mr Boyes. Thank you, Senator. Nicole Sheffield, Executive General Manager, Community and Consumer. Thank you, Senator, for that question. Uh, we work very closely with our licensees, our licensee partners and associations. The payment reform itself, we have had one consultation with LPOG and we have a, a first consultation with POAL, the other group, later this week. Um, once we understand um, the principles and agree what are the areas that we will be looking at, uh, then we will make for some recommendations and start working that, including, as per the first lot of payment reform, looking at those payments per outlet, because when you have so many outlets, 2,580, there are a lot of impacts, so when you make any changes to payments, there's going to be some um, impacts that we want to make sure that we understand across the entire network. So that requires a lot of modelling, a lot of consultation. As you know, the first payment reform was very successful and introduced $50 million worth of extra payments in the last two years to licensees, and that was all about ensuring that they were paid for parcels and for scanning. The second lot of payment reform is going to focus on community representation and the, the very important role that they play in that, but also at looking at our identity services and financial services. I feel very confident that uh, before the end of this financial year, we should have some really good parameters to move forward. So it has a budget. Thank you for that. And It'll save me giving my preamble for the next question. Uh, has a budget allocation been made for phase two reform implementation, which we understand is expected to begin shortly? So and what, what is the budget allocation for phase two? And when do you anticipate it will be commenced and then implemented? So budgets at the moment have not been um, concluded for next financial year. So we're in the process of discussing within the organisation all of that. But I can uh, tell you confidently, Senator, there will be a, a budget allocation. We've been discussing this and just like anything, we will put aside the, the required amounts. And that's part of the reason we've started the discussion so early in the, this year to make sure that we allocate the appropriate amount. And the last question, come with Senator extensive uh, consultation with the LPOs? Absolutely. Okay. In order to achieve sustainability for LPOs, does the significant change in volume between letters and parcel post require a review of the financial relationship between license with licensed post offices, especially if 
Yeah, that's all I need to say. Yeah. Um, look, we're always ensuring the viability of our licensed post office partners. We know how important they are for us to deliver our community service obligation, but actually they're, you know, they're, they're faced to our community, to regional and rural Australia. Their viability is critical. And just as we've seen COVID has created an e-commerce boom that none of us expected, we hoped, but none of us expected, that has changed the financial model you know, completely for our um, post offices because all of a sudden their revenue drivers are significantly more coming from parcels than we've ever seen. Um, and so it really is constantly working with them, looking at what products, services they are offering to their um, communities, what arrangements that we have, what opportunities we can have to introduce new products and services that will drive transactions and foot traffic for them. And I think it's something that we'll just constantly need to be looking at and and working with them to, to look at what, what we can do to grow. So, so we'll, Roberts, would you better put in your remaining questions on notice? Sure, certainly. Thank you. Thank you very much, Senator McKenzie. Five minutes, and that will be the last block. Yep. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you. <laughs> back again. Look, I just want to take you back to um, some of your earlier evidence around the BCG uh, report. I mean, the press release from the shareholder ministers says uh, this report was to inform the incoming chair. This is the 1st of November 2019. Now we're all, we're now, what, uh, 12, 15 months down the track and you're unable to use this report to um, uh, inform your corporate plan 2023, which is actually why the shareholder ministers uh, commissioned this report. Is that the case? Uh, well, to the extent that we haven't received any uh, re final report, that's true. Uh, we were able to benefit, however, in our ongoing discussion and dialogue while BCG was undertaking that review, uh, gleaming as they sought information from us, we were able to gleam information from them primarily about uh, benchmarking against what other uh, postal services were doing around the world, and, and, and that certainly has been an input for us of value. But it hasn't been able to... Um, but, but we've not seen the final report, so no. And so my question, again, goes to this review's recommendations and findings um, have been unable to inform you as incoming chair you know, 15 months ago, or the corporate plan as it was supposed to have done. Well, Senator, I think I'm asking the chair. Well, I'm asking the chair. Well, Considering it was the government that commissioned the report, surely the government should respond. I'm very happy to table the media release, which said why the report was actually commissioned 15 months ago. It was to inform the chair of Australia Post and to inform the corporate plan for Australia Post 20. 23. Well, it is now March 2021. The chair's evidence is that the final Senator McKenzie and Minister, you will be silent. Talking over each other is unedifying and does not actually enhance the reputation of the Senate. Minister, please answer. Thank you. So the review was designed for consideration by government in the context of assessing Australia Post strategies to deal with the changes in business and consumer needs, demand ser services and impact of long-term changes to the way that Australians use e-commerce and operating challenges. The report is the property of the shareholder departments, not Australia Post, and therefore it's inappropriate for Australia Post employees to speak to its contents. Senator McKenzie, you have the As point. my questions, we're not asking the chair to speak to its contents about how this report was its intent was to inform the corporate plan. Because it, the government is refusing to release it, uh, it is unable to do its perfunctory um, why it was actually commissioned in the first place. That's because Chair, it's still under I, cabinet consideration, Chair, can Senator I go McKenzie. To, um, when, just previously, when we were going through that period of time of uh, Christina Holgate being asked to stand aside following um, this review being announced, mm -hmm. you said... Um, you said the shareholders contacted. How did, how did the shareholders, how were you aware of the shareholders' decision to conduct a review? I was contacted by Minister Fletcher, I think I said right, earlier. Yep. Um, it would have been after, as I said, after the 
Senate Estimates hearings had concluded, but prior to question time. The Minister ran, uh, asked if I'd heard the responses in Senate Estimates. I said, yes, I'd yep. been listening. Um, and, uh, and then informed me that one, uh, they would be, the shareholders through the departments yep. would be conducting an, an investigation of the circumstances. Two, that Australia Post would should support that investigation in whatever yep. manner necessary. And three, that we should be seeking to stand uh, Christine down during the CEO down during the course of this four-week investigation. Right, so it was Minister Fletcher that it asked Minister Australia Fletcher, Post yes. to stand uh, Christina Holgate down whilst the investigation. Shh. Did Minister Fletcher follow up and did you have any communication with shareholders following the investigation um, to, following. to cease her employment? No, not in the slightest. Um, in fact, the investigation had not completed. The reality is events were overtaken by Christine taking the position herself. Order. Uh, can I please just have... Order. Order. Apologies. Ms Holgate. Yeah. Ms Holgate uh, uh, announced, announced her resignation on the 2nd of November, well before the review concluded. And last question. Thank you, Senator McKenzie. And, and, and finally, I go to... I mean, you're going through this incredible amount of work to find a new CEO. Mm -hmm. There's a lot in your own organisation, and I know as somebody from the regions, uh, your former CEO did an incredible amount of work to make particularly LPOs sustainable in re rural and regional Australia. And for Hansard, I note you're nodding. Um, I have written to you about eight weeks ago asking to ensure and give me a guarantee that a future CEO, one of those skill sets or experiences that you've got in your matrix is about the rural and regional component. I'll put all those questions on notice. But my question remains, <coughs> given in this Maddox report that there is no indication of dishonesty, fraud, corruption or intentional misuse of Australia Post fund uh, by this, why was Christina Holgate stood down? Uh, Ms Holgate was stood down to allow the search to take place, sorry, the investigation to take place over this four week period without any perceptions of interference during this process. And you process. stand by your earlier evidence that she resigned? <coughs> uh, yes, she resigned. Okay. In second, writing? In writing, on the 2nd of November. And Thank we you, responded Senator. on the same date, confirming her resignation on the 2nd of November. Thank you. We will now conclude our examination oh, of Australia Post. Senator Canavan's got some questions. Won't take long. We are well over time. You've got uh, right, two minutes. Issue. Issue. Um, just, just, just wanted to confirm that too. The 2nd of November, you say that Ms Holgate uh, sent, did she email or letter? Emailed each of the directors. Each of the directors with her resignation. Correct. Did that resignation accept any conditions placed on her that were proposed by the no, board she, or yourself? No, she sent the resignation. She didn't place any condition other than to state okay, the resignation clear, was effective immediately. Did you, did you, the board, or any other employees of Australia Post ask Ms Holgate prior to the 2nd of November to accept any conditions uh, um, when or if she stood down as well, her CEO? contract of employment uh, which she entered into when she uh, took on the role, uh, stipulated, amongst other things, that uh, she was required to give six months' notice before resignation took effect. She was required... OK, I'll be clear, because I've only got two minutes. Did you ask her to accept any conditions beyond what, which were already uh, outlined in her contract? Did you or no. anyone, for, anyone from the board? No. No, you did not, or anyone from the we, board of Australia Post ask we, Ms Holgate to accept any conditions on her resignation or standing aside? Yeah, the only issue uh, we did... Beyond the contract. Sorry, the only sorry. issue we did, I apologise, was that she wanted to take her resignation effective immediately and not give us the six months' notice. Oh, that was a condition. Uh, which was a condition of her employment. We, we went back to her and said, we agree to giving you the, the six months notice. And we asked her to confirm that she wasn't seeking that six months payment as per her letter, which said she would not take any financial compensation. 
Right. So there was no conditions placed on her that weren't... In fact, we were releasing her from a condition she had to us to give us the six months' notice. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. Thanks, that does Jack. conclude our uh, examination of Australia Post. You have could, agreed could... to take a number of things on notice. Um, if you could have those back to the committee by the 7th of May. Do you have one final clarification? Just, just one moment. Just... Uh, to say that uh, we did have a question on notice 204, which gave the outline of the skill sets for the board. So it's oh. it's. Oh great! All right. So did it's. I ask, is that did I ask that? Yes, you did ask that I question. Yeah. So it's on notice. Yeah. Apologies, okay. chair. Thank you very much to you and your team. Thank you.